Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? I think so. Okay, so good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be at GGI, and I would like to thank the organizer for setting up uh, this uh, very nice event. I hope uh, it will be a productive and uh, interesting week for everyone. So my talk is actually a good uh, continuation of Daddy that uh, sets a uh, and a majestic way the stage so I can build on what he has done and maybe focus on a couple of more of things. Um, yeah, so sorry, this is just to advertise uh, uh, funding agencies. So let's, uh, let's give my overview, given uh, the one of David, I want also to say something just to set the stage on myself. So what we think happened in a core collapse super uh, binary neutral star merger is that we have the in spiral phase where we have the two neutral stars that dance around each other they, of course, here the important parameter are the masses of the two neutral stars and the equation of state that sets the property of, of matter and uh, the capacity of matter to resist, to counterbalance the gravitational attraction. And here it can take uh, giga years for a binary system relatively tight to go from astronomical distances down, down to the distance where the two stars start to fill each other. This is the so-called in spiral phase. And uh, afterwards, things become much faster. The so-called merger phase is when the two star actually uh, crashes against each other. It's very fast here. The dynamical time scale is of the order of milliseconds. We already saw before the movie from David, very, very nice. And then there is the first phase in which gravitational wave emission is still the dominant uh, source of energy from the system. And after that, there is the formation Something like that, okay. Then there is uh, the post-merger phase in which the remnant is initially very oblated, strong gravitational wave emitter. It gets more and more axisymmetric, and then we enter the so-called viscous phase. If you want to understand a bit what happens in terms especially of neutrino and microphysics, you have, first of all, to get an idea of which is the speed at which the two neutron stars collide. Actually, just back of the envelope calculation tells you that uh, the orbital speed in units of the speed of light uh, is actually proportional to the square root of the so-called compactness parameters. And if you just plug in numbers, you will get that typically the new neutral star colliding with 40% of the speed of light. So you have like uh, an astronomical accelerator of particle, not uh, super high speed in terms of accelerator physics, but in terms, if you think that these objects are as massive as the sun or even more, it's, uh, it's huge. So we have a huge amount of kinetic energy. And this, as soon as the two stars touches each other, a good fraction, let's say alpha, of the kinetic energy of the system is converted into internal energy. So you take nuclear matter and you eat it up. It's amazing how back of the envelope calculation tells you that the typical temperature in the remnant must be 30, 50 MeV. And of course, whenever, whenever you have nuclear matter at those temperatures, photons are completely trapped. In, uh, in addition to gravitational waves, the other source uh, of energy becomes neutrino. You have copious neutrino production with luminosity, which are exactly on the same spot as the one of Col collapse supernovae. Sure. Uh, ah, yes, sorry. Oh, thanks. That's, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. So, OK, so. Yeah, yeah, so you were, I think if you understood correctly, you were saying when the system will collapse to a black hole. Exactly, so at any stage, the remnant can collapse to a black hole. Of course, it's not a random process, it depends. It depends on the masses on the two neutral star and on the equation of state. But as soon as if the merger app, so if the collapse happens immediately at merger, we call it prompt collapse. It means that the two masses were large enough, as for example, we think in GW190425, the two neutral stars were so massive that as soon as they touched, the, the space time was so, so curved that the, the singularity formed immediately. In, sorry? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Then does that mean that's even more massive than the hypermassive and the supermassive cases? Uh, yes. So it means that uh, you are even above that threshold. There are quantitative studies that try to quantify what is the ratio between the maximum mass, the sum of the two M1 plus M2, compared with uh, the maximum TOV solution. And there are, I mean, 
for the prompt collapse case, it's not a universal constant, depends on the equation of state, but it's uh, definitely above 1.3, 1.4 or at that stage. Okay, thanks. But it could be if you if the system survives the prompt collapse, it could be that it enters the other phase, but uh, as the movie of David was showing, it could happen that in the first 10 milliseconds, the system collapses. Depends again on the equation of state on the masses. You can think that if the two masses are light enough or the equation of state is particularly stiff, the system can actually survive all the way down, producing possibly something that uh, will collapse maybe on the spin down time scale. It's probably a corner case, but we cannot exclude it. Yeah. So, so this system is up and the photons are trapped. Neutrinos, are, are they trapped in some way? Or? And this is the difficult part of the story. Oh. While we can say that photons are practically trapped uh, with a million of years uh, of uh, escape uh, time scale, for the neutrinos, in the central part, they are trapped. Uh, this is what actually David showed in the last part of his talk. But of course, we have a gradient of densities. Within uh, 50 kilometers, densities goes uh, from nuclear saturation density down to 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7. And there, they are completely free streaming. This is why you need uh, transport, because uh, you cannot approximate either in the diffusive regime or in the free streaming. You have to include all the regime in your simulation. This is the complicated part of the business. Mm -hmm. So you have both. And the... Uh... The difference between the luminosity in gravitational wave and uh, in neutrino is somewhat uh, related to yes, diffusion you know, time. Yes, it's a pretty robust result. Okay. 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 Uh, so this is more or less what happens to the bulk of the ejecta, of course, so bulk of the matter. But uh, luckily for the rest of the universe, there is a tiny fraction of matter that actually leaves the system. This is what we call the ejecta. It's a very few percent of the total mass of the system, but since it's matter coming from a neutron star, it starts at least very, very neutron rich. And then, of course, neutrino can change it, but uh, we can say quite safely that the bulk of matter stays relatively neutron rich. And so, it's, uh, um, as, we, as we will see, it's the ideal place where our process nucleosynthesis can take place. As David was mentioning, there are several mechanisms that act on a different time scale, as this is a summary of what he already showed. There is the first one that comes out, the dynamical ejecta. It's due to tides or shocks. It's relatively fast. The neutrino don't have enough time to interact with it, or depending, depends actually a bit where, where, you, where you are. At least along the equator, they are sufficiently shielded. But it's a relatively small amount. So 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. 10 to the minus 2 is very... A uh, rare case when you have a really tidally disruptive event. Then we have a wind. So imagine that the, the central remnant has collapsed to a black hole. You had the formation of a disk. And then on the viscous time scale, on the time scale where neutrino matters a lot, then there is the possibility for this wind, this disk to evaporate through these winds. And this can be very effective because uh, between 10 and 40% of the mass of the disk can actually uh, be expelled in this way. And uh, there is something which is in between. So imagine that in the center, we don't have uh, an immediate black hole formation, but we have uh, a massive neutron star. And then, as we saw in the movie from David, there was this spiral wave that developed. They are very efficient in transporting angular momentum. And the properties of the spiral wave, wave wind, you can imagine them to be somehow intermediate between the two. And this is actually where neutrino can play the major role. Keep in mind, uh, but we have. So, uh, as I said, why it's important this kind of ejecta? Because it's the ideal place where our process nucleosynthesis can take place. If you want to compute the hills of our process nucleosynthesis, that's complicated business. You have to solve a system with several thousand of ODE. But uh, so if you want to get the details of that, uh, you need tracer, you need uh, a, a nuclear network. Luckily for us, if you want to discuss at least a qualitative level the outcome, if, you, if the entropy stays relatively low and you can assume that in a good approximation the matter expands in an homologous way, then you can say that the most relevant parameter is the so-called electron fraction. Electron fraction, you can think about it as uh, the parameter that sets the relative importance between, you, uh, between neutrons and protons. And so you understand easily that a reaction like uh, the capture of an electron neutrino over a neutron or the capture of an electron neutrino over a proton is key, of course, with their uh, inverse reaction to set precisely what is the way of the matter that is ejected. But as you can see, depending on the way, you can, act, you can have actually the production of second and third process peak, 
or if the way gets above, let's say, a certain kind of threshold, which is roughly between 0 0.22, 25, then you start producing the first uh, R process peak and not the second. Clearly, the ejecta comes out uh, as a mixture of those, as a histogram from David was showing. So we do expect uh, a mixture of this uh, ejecta pattern. Um, where does microphysics enter in all the business? It answers practically everywhere because it's a fundamental ingredient of our simulation. Uh, one of the first things that uh, you mentioned, probably it has been mentioned last week, uh, if uh, Jim was, was around, of course, the equation of state. In order to make our simulation, we need an equation of state, uh, state of the art, our final temperature, composition, dependent equation of state, the minimal set. So the first question that you can, you must ans uh, ask yourself is, which kind of particle do I want in my simulation? The minimal set of particles that you need are definitely neutron, protons, electron, positrons, and photons. Uh, this is a uh, Somehow you cannot escape uh, this, uh, this set. And this was actually also the one that is typically included in Corpo Lab Supernova simulation. And of course, already doing that job is a challenge because uh, we don't know our QCD. We don't know the solution of QCD at low energy. So we need uh, to uh, approximate the nuclear interaction. We have the many body treatment. We have, of course, that you are not doing it at T equal zero. You do it at finite temperature. These are all nuclear business stuff. But in addition, there are even more basic questions. For example, is really the set that we are including the one that is uh, uh, the necessary one, or are we missing something? Of course, if you go at high density, you can think about hyperons and quarks. Uh, if you reach high temperature, you start producing pions. You should not neglect pions. But there is also muons, which is not exotic physics, but we know that they are there. And so I will also talk about them. The other ingredient, of course, is neutrino, as it was uh, uh, explained by David. It's a non-trivial problem because you have to include in the same simulation all the regimes. So the optical depth varies by five, six order of magnitude from the center to the optically thin part. State of the art is what has been shown before. So energy integrating two moment schemes, typically supplemented by a phenomenological transport equation for the number density, they are accurate. They are a proper transport. So everywhere in the domain, we can say that we, could have, we can have an accurate and consistent solution. Of course, they are computationally expensive. It takes uh, quite a significant amount of resources. There could be closure artifacts because it's still an approximation, but okay, it's something that uh, we can actually measure. For several years, uh, the other scheme that uh, uh, the community has used very much uh, was uh, also mentioned by David. It's an energy integrated hybrid scheme in which uh, the, the, the stiff part of the problem, the optically thick one, is treated by a leaking scheme, and then you have a transport M0 in the center. Of course, it's computationally and also conceptually easier, but of course, it's more approximate. I mentioned because I will show most of the results from the second one, so I wanted to compare the two so that you can actually gauge a bit and put into the context my result. So what does it mean to include neutrino in your simulation? OK, one thing is uh, uh, very tough, tough is to very tough problem is to model the transport, but of course uh, you have also the right hand side. So you have to include also the collision integral. The collision integral typically looks uh, something like that. So you have uh, N and J. Uh, so J is the density of energy, H is the flux. And then you have the terms that, uh, uh... okay, thanks. Okay, so you have, uh, 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 you have emissivity, absorptivity, both for scattering and uh, of uh, um, absorption opacity, scattering, absorption. And then, of course, the question is, I have to compute those quantities based on the reaction that I want to put in my simulation. For historical reasons that, in my opinion, mostly come from the fact that we benefit from the work done in core collapse and practically copy-paste it in the context of binary intrastar merger, this is the golden set of reaction that practically most, if not all, simulation at the moment include. So you can see uh, electron and positron capture with their inverse reaction. Then there is the dominant source of scattering, which is the scattering of uh, nucleons. You have pair processes to produce the mu and the tau. This is more or less, again, the minimal set of reaction. And then, of course, there is a bunch of uh, dif difficulties or non-trivial th things that you have to do. So if you want to go from, from a grave, sorry, from uh, a spectral, uh, because energy matters in all this reaction, but we have a gray scheme, so you have to energy integrate, something like that, and so there are different prescriptions. These are more or less more technical things. I leave them on the slide. It's not important to discuss them in detail, but to show you that uh, it's non trivial even the right-hand side is the non-trivial uh, problem, and to get a simulation on doing what you expect physically, it's uh, highly non-trivial.
Sure. Yes. Because I mean, in general, can be important even angles. So, I mean, these are unidimensional simulation. You have a oh, three dimensional okay. effect. What do you? Three dimensional simulation. But then energy is important. I mean, energy is not distributed uh, isotropically. I mean, depends. Sometimes it is, but not always. If I manage not to take too too much to get to the final slide, that there will be an image that will really capture your attention. How isotropic is a bineutral star merger? My bineutral star merger and neutrino interaction are both highly energy dependent and non isotropic. For the isotropy moment scheme, of course, uh, takes into account uh, that because you integrate over the variable angle, but you're still solving the problem in a three-dimensional grid. And so you can, the fluxes can actually move matter in a three-dimensional world. Concern, but we could do spectrally. It's uh, 10, 20 times more consuming, and it's already quite consuming. So at the moment, the limitation is actually computational in that respect. But, but you're right. We are sacrificing something, but this is what we can do. OK, so now in the second part, after this introduction, in the second part of the, my talk, I want to prove to you with some quantitative result that including neutrino is important to compute some relevant observable. For example, are we in a stage where we can say some information about what is the typical luminosity, what is the typical mean energy that comes out from a set of simulation, not from one or two? Are we in a stage where we can actually measure impact, for example, in kilonova spectra or in uh, uh, sediments? And the more basic question, are we sure that we are including all the relevant species and how do the physics depend on that? So let's start with the first topic, neutrino luminosities. So what we did, as, as, I, as I told you, which WSGTHC code is a code that has uh, already a uh, few years and then it has been extensively used, especially with the uh, leakage plus M0 scheme. And so we had, uh, we, uh, as a part of the core collaboration, we had access to a larger number of simulations. We selected 66 bineutral star merger corresponding to 51 different configurations. We had a large span in, uh, in masses. We explored different equation of state in order not to be biased. We have several mass ratios. So Q is the mass ratio, Q equal once means equal binary. Q larger than one means very asymmetric, so 1.80 means that uh, the, second, the secondary was actually uh, almost half the primary. And then, of course, uh, as, uh, uh, as we do numerical experiment, we have also to test the resolution. The good point is that uh, the setup is very homogeneous in terms of, of coding. All the simulations were performed with, with THC and with the same neutrino treatment. And so what we could do, we could actually extract the luminosity and the mean energy in the same, with the same flavor that people in core collapse community do. So in order to characterize that. So this is more or less a slide that uh, at a qualitative level tells you what happens. So why there are four columns? Because these are actually the different outcomes of the merger. On the, on the left, you have a so-called prompt collapse. You see here the density. So the two neutral stars were actually in spiraling up to merger. At merger, the density jumps, but the jump never ends because the system is not able the matter is not able to counterbalance gravity. Density just increases. Space-time forms a singularity, and you get a black hole. In the second column, you see the corresponding neutrino luminosity. Notice that the time has different scale, while on the y-axis, you have always the same scale, so you can actually compare this neutrino luminosity. You can see that prompt collapse do not produce a lot of neutrinos. These are actually the weakest event. Here, you have a short lead. What does it mean? It means that the system undergoes a merger, there are a few bounces. The central object is very far from equilibrium, so it bounces back and forth, back and forth. The temperature does the same, but at a certain point, let's say a few milliseconds after merger, it collapses. You see, we start see some interesting feature in the neutrino luminosity, free flavor. Here and here, the central object was able to survive a bit longer. So here it was able to survive 12. There are also simulations where they survive 20, 25. And here, it's practically a bit the corner case that we mentioned before. The system was sufficiently light such that the central object never collapsed in our simulation. So what can we say about the, the, the luminosity? First of all, look at the axis, 5 times 10 to the 53. Indeed, they are very similar to the one of core collapse, actually a bit larger than those. Differently from core collapse, there is no typo. Nu E bar is above nu E because the system is extremely neutron rich. And so it tends to leptonize and not to deleptonize. And so at least in the beginning, 
there is the highest peak is actually in electron type neutrino. So you see that something very violent happens here because this, this is where actually the star actually crashes with the largest speed where the largest amount of kinetic energy is converted into internal energy. And of course, it takes a few seconds for the neutrino to come out as uh, in the case of supernovae with the, with the shock break, uh, with the neutrino sphere breakout of the shock. And afterwards, there is a huge peak. And this is followed by secondary peak. The secondary peak is because the system is oscillating. And so the neutrino somehow takes into account, even if there is no one-to-one -one correspondence, it's a bit more complicated. And as you can see, at a late time, as it happens in core collapse, new and new bar tends to get closer and closer, which is actually, I must admit, uh, still a mystery to me, both in core collapse and BNS, why it happens, why it happens in both. If someone has the answer, write me an email. Um, OK, so what we did with those, just uh, a slide which is a, a bit out of context. Let me ju just use it to introduce a quantity. You know that when the two neutron star get close enough, while an isolated neutron star is a perfect sphere, in a binary system, when they get close enough, they start to feel uh, the gravitational feel of each other, in particular the tidal field, and they get uh, deformed. This tidal deformation in a linear response theory is typically expressed by this lambda or K2 parameter. You maybe probably heard about that. And it's uh, important to remark that in the gravitational wave signal, what we see is not the lambda or K2 of the single star, but is a linear combination of those, which is typically called the lambda tilde in most of the paper you probably heard. So for us, uh, this is just uh, to tell you that uh, in the next few slides, I will show you some graph with respect to lambda tilde. This lambda tilde is the tidal deformation of the binary. That's it. Um, in the case of gravitational waves, uh, coming one of the questions that came out, where is 10 to the 53 erg per second? This came out also from simulation within the core database. And we found that this, this luminosity actually tends to have a nice correlation once you somehow massage a bit them with the, uh, a, co a, linear co a linear combination of the tidal deformability. So in some sense, uh, there is a correlation between the luminosity and uh, the degree of deformation. So we ask ourselves, uh, is it the same for gravitation, for uh, neutrino luminosity, or is something different? So we, we studied, for example, as a function of lambda tilde, the luminosity, the peak luminosity. So how high is uh, the first peak, the, the largest that we have observed? So as you can see, the, the picture is not as good as the previous one. There is no tight correlation. However, if you look at it a bit better, you can notice that. Forget for one moment about the square. The square are the prompt collapse. So everything that is above here is not promptly collapsing. If you consider only relatively symmetric stuff, you see that there is a kind of trend. So there is a trend with lambda tilde telling you that, oh, so, sorry, if lambda tilde is small, typically the masses are larger and the system is more symmetric. So this is where we expect the most violent merger to occur because these are big stars that do not promptly collapse, but they are big enough to make a big crash. And this is where the largest luminosity happens. It happens in all flavors. So what I discuss here holds for those. There is a modulation in that, in the sense that the, the, the nice increasing trend that is only for the symmetric, but if you include now the ratio the mass ratio effect, you see that there is a, the, situ the situation becomes milder, more confused, because the system is not crashing, really. The, the secondary star gets tidally destroyed, and so the, the collision is a bit less violent because there was some pre-dynamics. On the other hand, if you consider the prompt, then the situation changes dramatically. There is a much weaker variability, and the variability, all the symmetric cases tends to stay here. The variability is expected to be related only with, uh, with the Q value. So overall, we can say that uh, there is a sort of trend. We can understand it. It's not uh, as robust as the one in the gravitational wave luminosity, but it's related with the dynamics. We, um, oh, maybe this is a bit detailed. I can skip. Uh, of course, the free panel that I showed, uh, you see that there are different flavors. You can ask yourself, uh, do the different flavors correlate among them? For example, if the Nui has the largest luminosity, can I say something about the, sorry, the Nui bar? Can I say something about Nui and Nuex? As this graph show, the three are actually pretty much correlated. They are not on a straight line, but uh, provided the, the uncertainty that we had, we could say that there is a good correlation between uh, the different luminosity among them. And uh, the other interesting question that we ask ourselves is, uh, if we have two messengers, gravitational wave and neutrinos, uh, do they correlate among them? 
And once again, here, the prompt collapse uh, is a bit uh, the, uh, the game changer, because if you don't consider prompt collapse, uh, there is also here in, an indication of correlation, but we expect, because even in the case of neutrino luminosity, the more, the less deformable the star are, so the smaller is lambda tilde, the larger we add the luminosity. This is the same as it was very tight with gravitational waves. Of course, there is a completely different trend in the case of gravitational wave, and we can understand it, because the neutrino need the collision, need the central remnant to survive. Gravitational wave don't need that necessarily, in the sense that the peak is reached at merger, at the moment of merger. The prompt collapse typically happens afterwards, and so it's not surprising that we see these two, two branches. Okay, what about the mean energy? This is another important quantity. What is the man energy that come out from the system? And you can see the first, so this is a new E, new E bar, and a new X. So what you can see is that despite the fact that we change the, the, the luminosity, we change the masses, we change the equation of state, the mean luminosity seems to be pretty robust. It seems to be practically flat. There are some tendencies, but they are not so robust. So first of all, why nu e is smaller than nu e bar, smaller than uh, mu and tau? This, this depends on the place where the, the, the neutrino decouple. So where is uh, the place where the last inelastic interaction occurs? And we know that the mu and tau, since they are mostly driven by pair processes, decouple much deeper inside compared to nu e bar, while nu e, they interact a lot with the neutrons. And so it's very, very common that uh, uh, it's, it's understandable that they have the lowest luminosity. So you see that there is a well-defined hierarchy. OK. Um, how far am I? Five, ten minutes? It means that I have to choose one of the two final topics. OK. Um, the second thing that I think can be a good observable is, of course, uh, nucleosynthesis. You may have heard that uh, in uh, GW 17817, we have indication that there could be strontium in the ejecta. In the beginning, the community was pretty skeptical, I think for the simple reason that the strontium was not considered an process element. People were ready to see uh, europium, gold, uh, platinum, but not strontium, because it's a mixture and actually comes mostly from the S process, but it's also an R process element. Anyway, I am agnostic in that respect. I'm not an observer. I don't know how robust is the, the identification. But uh, I took that number. So from modeling, we know that uh, maybe a few times 10 to the minus 5 solar masses of strontium were produced. Do we expect it in our simulation? So what we checked is actually we took nucleosynthesis from a relatively large sample of simulation. We analyzed with a relatively degree of details the amount of, of ejecta. And what you can see is that strontium is robustly produced, both in the dynamical ejecta and in the spiral wave wind. So it's a relatively common product, and we saw, we understand it from David's talk, because the YE gets high enough such that you can produce first our process peak elements. The only thing that we can exclude is that the system was very asymmetric, because in that case, the YE doesn't change dramatically, there is no spiral wave wind, and so how can you produce strontium? The interesting thing is that if you really believe the number that the observer provides in terms of strontium, and you measure how much strontium you get, you see that already the dynamical ejecta is enough to produce most of it. What does it mean if you really believe the data that we come, come from our simulation and come from the observer? Is that the spiral wave wind cannot have a long phase. Otherwise, we should have an overproduction of strontium. So the interesting thing here is that uh, if you believe with all the caveats that I told you, it's an indication that it's true that GW170817 did not promptly collapse, but it also didn't live very long. Otherwise, we should have maybe an overproduction of strontium. I think it's a good uh, proof of principle. I'm not sure that I can trust completely the numbers, but I think it's a good indication. Another interesting thing actually was triggered by a talk that uh, Rebecca gave last, uh, last, uh, last year in Trento. The point is that when you do nucleosynthesis, you typically are interested in what you can see in a kilonova a few days after, or what you can see in old metal poor stars that are giga years long. But what about in between? There is also things that live in between. Of course, there are some, rad um, some um, radioactive isotopes. Uh, um, Yeah, right, uh, live radioactive isotopes, which have uh, a decay time scale, uh, for example, of a few million of years. Of course, they tend to disappear 
toward cosmological uh, uh, scale. However, if you had an event which was close enough and relatively recent, you could have this radio isotope that can, that can tell you something about something that happens close by in a relatively recent uh, period. For example, there was this very nice result that came out with some C, um, with some uh, um, deep sea crust uh, sediments. They were able to find iron 60 in the sediments. I will focus in this talk actually only on this peak, but there is also a secondary peak. And this is very nice. The other thing that was very nice is that in the same sediment, people could find, in addition to iron 60, plutonium 244. We are speaking about uh, less than 200 uh, uh, atoms, but still it's a significant fraction, much smaller. So we are pretty sure about, people are pretty sure about uh, the, the detection of this. And then you can make the ratio. What is the challenge here? The challenge here is given by the interpretation, how to interpret this. Because typically iron 60 is uh, synthesized in core collapse supernovae. It's a typical yield for core collapse supernovae. Plutonium, on the other hand, it's a typical, it's an actinite, it's an unprocess element. It's something that needs extremely neutron-rich matter. We don't think that standard core collapse neutron star can do that. How you can reconcile the thing? Of course, people, one and collaborators, Rebecca was also in that paper, they tried to come up with an explanation. And somehow their conclusion was that maybe some special classes of supernova, correct me if I'm wrong, special classes of supernova alone or the combination of a previous supernova that polluted the local bubble, followed by another, for example, event which dragged some of the pre-existing plutonium could actually explain what to be observed now. The kilonova were dramatically failing, but since I am a kilonova fan, I took it as a challenge and I said, are we sure that kilonova cannot do the job? So we checked in our simulation, and uh, we also noticed that uh, in the Wang and collaborator, they typically consider BNS model that form a promptly black hole, so no spiral wave wind. Moreover, they consider the ejecta isotropized. So we did the following experiment. We again consider a bunch of simulation, different equation of state with neutrino included, the, the usual stuff that I said before. We computed the same quantity, so the ratio between two elements, but we retained the information about the angle, we didn't integrate over all angle. Practically, we assumed that uh, there was no efficient mixing when the matter was coming on Earth. And uh, we parameterized the function of the T wind, that's kind of detailed, it's just to explain why there are bands. And we consider the two isotopes. So what happens is that if you consider a model that does not collapse to a black hole, but form an hyper, a, a massive neutron star that has a significant spiral wave wind, there are at least two simulations that without touching the data, just taking as they come out from the simulation, produces the observed ratio. Pretty, pretty straightforward what we did. So this was very promising. It's not enough because, of course, you could have these events, but to match the fluxes, it could be that these events happen much, much far away. I didn't, com I didn't comment it, but this was the meaning of this plot. A kilonova not only would have not produced the right ratio, but the kilonova would have been at the edge of our galaxy, which doesn't make sense because you want something which reach the solar system. In our case, when we repeat the calculation, the more or less the, the two independent model and the two independent curves more or less matches within, let's say, between 100 and 200 parsec from us, which is more or less compatible with the size. And also the time, there was no actually fine tuning. There is a still um, range. So what is the take home message, mostly for Rebecca? I'm not sure that the kilonova did the right job. I'm just saying that if you include neutrinos, uh, they're not ruled out. And very interesting from this paper, both in your paper and in our paper, we set other uh, isotopes, which could actually help in discriminating. So let's see in the future, more isotopes can actually break more degeneracies. Last but not least, if I have two minutes, muons. Muons, as I said, uh, uh, are not included typically in state of the art simulation, but we know that already called the neutron star have muons. If you want to convince yourself, just compute the chemical potential from a relativistic gas of electron and from a non relativistic gas of muon. And for typical condition, you will see that they are comparable. Indeed, called the equation of state that the nuclear physicists use, they do include muons. So, why don't we include it in our simulation? Well, maybe because they're negligible, but maybe not. 
So what we did uh, with uh, Leonora Lofredo, ah, by the way, the work before was mostly done by a PhD student of mine, uh, Leonardo Chiesa. This was done by Leonora Lofredo. What we did is we did something which is uh, always pretty, compli pretty complicated. We took a simulation where there were no muons, but based on the outcome of that, if you assume that the importance of muons is, uh, they are important but not so important so that they can be considered first order negligible, you can do a post-processing analysis and include them. So what we did, we took a result of a simulation, uh, several simulations, we did the post-processing analysis estimating the lepton, electron, and muon number and the internal energy we solve for this system, assuming that the muons and the neutrinos are in equilibrium. The outcome, these are actually the input from our simulation. The outcome is that uh, the muons are actually present above 10 to the 13 gram per cubic centimeter. Most of them come from the cold neutron star because you have the muons that come from the cold neutron star, but then you can produce them afterwards due to the temperature. It turns out that uh, the, the bulk of them is the one from the cold neutron star. So even if you don't have a super detailed muon physics, if you already include and then add back them, you do a better job than neglected them. And actually the net fraction, be careful it's net fraction, is already between 30 and 70% of the net electron fraction. Of course, you don't have a lot of anti new anti muons. They are important not only because they are present, but because they can change the kind of neutrinos, especially. So as it was mentioned before, if you don't have charge, charge so if you have only electrons and positrons, so the only charge current reaction that you can have are the one on electron neutrino and electron and neutrino. If you include muons as well, you open new channels. And indeed, the symmetry between the mu and tau neutrino is broken, and the mu and tau no, sorry, the mu neutrino and antineutrino become more similar to the electron neutrino and antineutrino, leaving the tau neutrino a bit alone. This is more or less the take home message from this. And the, the pressure, if you take into account that or, or not, you can actually muons and then trap neutrino. The error that you do in the pressure is of the order of a few percent. Okay. So this leads to my conclusion. Sorry for taking a bit longer. So I hope I convince you that uh, neutrinos are key player in binary neutron star merger. It's necessary, it's mandatory to have uh, more and more accurate modeling. And uh, for example, I showed you that this is important if you want to address problem related with the nucleosynthesis, uh, with uh, both in the context of kilonovae, but also if you want to explain a very interesting sediment observation. Numerical simulation has dramatically improved, as David has shown us. The transport now is in a very good shape. I think it's now a task for the community to improve the right-hand side, the collision integral, because there is missing physics there, possibly missing uh, uh, reaction. Missing physics is still uh, not, uh, not super accurate. And this is, of course, necessary input. For example, if you want to do, as it was mentioned before, even in a post-processing way, neutrino oscillation studies, you need to know, first of all, what is the background, right? And the geometry and the energy here are maybe very different compared with the one of collapse. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Time for questions, further questions, comments? Yeah, sure. So during the merge, there are these peaks in, um, in the max density and temperature. They're sort of reflected in, in neutrino luminosities. It's not perfect. Yeah. Could that's you just good... elaborate on the relationship? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good question. I, I briefly sketched, I said, oh, they, they correlate, but not. So initially, my, our hope was that there was a one-to-one -one correlation, right? If you do the plot on the right, you do the plot on the left, uh, you see the peak, 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 peak. This happened in the very beginning. Afterwards, uh, it seems that the luminosity peak has a delay. But this you can understand because uh, more or less what you are looking in the top panel are the central density and central temperature. So they are related with what happens deep in the center of the system. The neutrino emission in the beginning, the remnant is small, and so the time that it takes for the perturbation to reach the, pro the point where neutrino can stream out is relatively small. But as soon as the remnant develops because of the bounces, the remnant becomes more and more extended. And so the, the pressure wave that you produce in the center takes time to reach uh, uh, the edge. And this 
I think at the quality level can explain why the, with time the neutrino peaks uh, tends to shift more and more, more and more on the right and tend to become weaker and weaker because the system becomes less and less bouncy and more and more axisymmetric, more homogeneous, and this leads to a more constant emission rather than uh, a TK emission. Thanks. So, so you showed these uh, uh, neutrino spectral energies, yeah. which there was an enormous hierarchy between the flavors. Yeah. And and of course, this was all found in very old supernova, but then later, one doesn't find these large hierarchies in, in, in modern day supernova uh, simulations. I mean, one has tens of percent effect, but not factor of two effect that you seem to show. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, are these using the same microphysics, or is, is that older that, versus that, newer, very... or is this physics? Uh, that, that, that's a very interesting, uh, it gives me the opportunity to go to my last slide that I didn't have time to go through, but I will go now. Uh, first of all, it depends when. So when people perform core collapse simulation, nowadays they can go up to one second. And so typically the initial large hierarchy was typically referring to the first uh, 50 milliseconds, while the more you wait, the more the mean energy become closer and closer. Here, I think there, there is something similar. There is another thing, uh, and it's which reaction are included in your, in your simulation. One of the driver of the effect that you show, especially in the proton-neutron star phase, after the accretion phase, when you have only the proton neutron which is cooling, there you can clearly see that all the mean energy tend to become closer and closer. There is a, the scattering, inelastic scattering of neutrino of uh, electron and positrons. This is not included typically in our simulation. Uh, this is one of exactly the simulation that we miss in our set but uh, core collapse supernova people include it and have an effect. And uh, just as a super preliminary result, uh, this is a master thesis uh, work where people were student of mine, he computed the uh, neutrino surfaces, so where they decouple. And I would like that you focus here. So this is, uh, you see, there are actually two kinds of line, the solid and the dashed, okay? The solid, these are the neutrino sphere for different energies. So the smaller the energy, the smaller the neutrino sphere. The larger the energy, the larger the neutrino sphere. In the right plot, it seems that you don't see dashed line because they are all here. All the neutrino decouple practically at the surface of the massive neutron star. Once you include this reaction here, because of the high temperature that characterizes this region, all the neutrino sphere get pushed outside not by one or two kilometers, by 25, 30 kilometers. Depends, of course, on the energy. I'm not saying that all the neutrino sphere get, but you have something which, uh, where the spectrum is defined here, let's say within uh, two, five kilometers, with something which is much more similar to that. If you just make a super, super easy plot like this one, you take the red is the temperature, you multiply the temperature by 3.12 which is a Fermi function in zero of order three divided by Fermi function to order zoo in zero. This is, gives you the typical energy that you expect from a black body with that temperature. Of course, in the center is hot, outside is cold, you see this trend. Then you take the number, the radii that you get from here and you draw it here. The interception between the two lines is more or less where you expect uh, the most important neutrino sphere for the outer spectrum to be. If I don't include the neutrino electron scattering, you see I am between 26 and 30, which is a bit an overestimate. But if I do that, I go down to 20. The delta between these points here and this point here gives you an error on the spectrum that we could at the moment do without that reaction. So I think the more reaction that we are going to include, the, the smaller the difference we are going to see, in my opinion, in the, in the spectrum. Can I just add to my question? I mean, we are seeing here this lambda sub en, which is a square root of. Uh, yeah. So, so when you should dis distinguish between the energy decoupling and scattering exactly, decoupling. Exactly. So when, is... when, when you speak about the neutrino sphere, what exactly do you mean? Here, I mean the one way they thermally decouple, not when they free stream. Otherwise, I should have plotted only the, the optical depth that comes from lambda tot. However, if you are interested in the one that uh, make thermal contact, you need to do that average. So related to this, um, so you can either have more uh, reactions, as you were saying, but there's also the issue of getting better rates for the reactions that yes. you already include. 
which one do you think is more important or is are there some reactions that for example better orca rates we we heard before which one do you think is more important i don't have an answer and it could be that the answer is different from the different level for example uh, i mean Judging from this plot, uh, I would say that uh, it's very, very important to include uh, this process for the heavy flavor. It could be totally negligible for the others because you can barely see the effect. Doesn't mean that maybe if you have more physics, for example, the race that we include now, typically in, uh, since we use analytic formulas, uh, they, for example, even don't include uh, the contribution from the rest mass of the electrons which is a tiny contribution, but then they don't include uh, weak magnetism. They don't include physics that we know and it's standard in core collapse. So uh, that's a very good question. I think we need uh, a few more years to answer your question, but both are very relevant. Excuse me, I'm curious about something. You Before you were speaking uh, about uh, pressure waves that uh, uh, go inside this, uh, this object uh, in connection with uh, the emissivity of neutrino, um, but I would expect that what is relevant is the heat diffusion time, you know, to understand uh, how it is, tra is transferred within the system. In normal star, these two times can be very different, you know, the time which affects the dynamical structure, you know, the dynamical processes and the time of diffusion of heat. And I would expect that the first is more related to gravitational waves and the other one is related to neutrino emission. In this object, they are similar or... Uh, I mean, no, the, it's, a, it's a, of course... So if I understood correctly, you're saying if I make a central object, which is very hot, I have to wait uh, heat to come out uh, also. Here, I think it's slightly different because the central part is actually uh, relatively cold, especially in terms of Fermi energy. It's actually the coolest part of the system. The point is that uh, the, the waves uh, are initially sound waves because it's very hard to shock nuclear matter. But uh, due to, the, steep, due to the, the gradient intensity, there is a steepening on the wave, which transforms that into shock waves. And then they become very efficient in dissipating kinetic energy. So there is these uh, steps. Um, moreover, there is also connection. Yeah, yeah. This is the connection, I would say. And the other thing is that you can actually produce neutrinos deep inside, where matter is colder, uh, uh, sorry, hotter. And then because of the expansion, you put this into free streaming condition, and this uh, give also burst, for example. So I think there is also this mechanism which is similar to what happens in core collapse when the shock reaches the neutrino surfaces and suddenly all the neutrino that were trapped can stream freely. Here, of course, it's a bit less clear because it's not a 1D process, but I can imagine that uh, fluid elements that were very hot and it trapped, uh, you somehow, because of this uh, spiral arm expansion, suddenly becomes optically thin and this neutrino can finally stream out. Another question concerning the reaction, because uh, you show reaction involving typically hadrons, so neutrons, protons, but at some point you also cite quarks and hyperons. Yeah. So my question is, uh, do we form a quark gluon plasma uh, sometimes in this neutron stand? There is this possibility, because I mean, it's very different the physics of hadrons from the physics of quarks. Yeah. So what's your, I mean... You, we don't know. Definitely, I don't know, but uh, I can safely say that we don't know as a community in the sense that uh, there have been a lot of work uh, in the past uh, 10 years uh, to explore the potential impact of the phase transition to quark. This is a very hot topic. Okay. We don't know. We, we know for sure that a certain density that will be a phase transition. Mm -hmm. We don't know where and the, if this is realized in nature. If it is realized somewhere in nature, it must be realized here because it's the closest things to a black hole from a massive and hot plasma. So there is plenty of study uh, that uh, also in our group, uh, mm -hmm. paper lead by a student of Davi. Davi, we also explored the potential impact in the gravitational wave theory. Going to the microphysics of that, of course, the phase transition, people don't know if it's first order crossover. This is uh, very speculative. I would say now community is moving towards from first order in the past, past few years, more towards a phase transition. Um, crossover phase transition. So, but I honestly don't know exactly which are the but, but in, the, yes, but independently on the kind of first transition, the point is that when you have quarks, I mean, the 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 the, the description of the reaction change. So, yeah. I mean, it's not only a matter if yeah. it is first order or, or crossover or whatever. I'm not aware of any study that study in details uh, 
the, uh, the transition to port, including consistently. I see. So there is no simulation where this kind, uh, I mean, no simulation where you have, instead of reaction involving uh, nucleons, there are quarks. As far as I know, nothing. What typically you assume is that uh, uh, the quark part get into weak equilibrium. Uh -huh. This is the only thing that people assume. I see. And for hyperons instead, also same, nothing. So no. Only some studies on the phase transition are not simulations that include this already. Not the transport at the level of details that you can have with uh -huh. us. And then let me ask only last question on this. But then, I mean, all these reactions, you, have, you say you have tables of, re, uh, tables of uh, for instance, uh, results as a function of temperature, uh, not temperature, as a function of energy or whatever. Or, I mean, where do you, from where do you get this table? This is just standard literature. These are like uh, it's literature, yes. standard yeah, literature that is included. But this is something that we can conclude from the 80s, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the point is that the first work tended to treat uh, the neutrino sector and the equation of state sector a bit independently. Now, with time, people are more or less stressing the fact that the neutrino reactions are intimately related with the equation of state uh, because there are all the interaction effects that were neglected in the past. But uh, yeah, it's literature, but still in development. I have a, a, a general question, that, just a curiosity. Yeah. Uh, I'm aware of uh, developments in holography where they uh, uh, pretend they can treat the weak processes, in particular neutrino nucleon, very recently, and that could be of use for uh, neutron stars, uh, neutron star merger. Do you know if so uh, I missed the hol hol holographic uh, holography is being used for, to treat? I know that. For some quark equation of state, they use holographic models, but mm. I never heard about uh, the impact uh, for the neutrino. No. Okay. No, no this is very. Yeah, yeah, okay, no. Okay, no, no, I'm not aware. Okay. So this is about um, thermal muons. Um, at, on your slide, I think you said like, you know, new mu or new mu bar dominates. You mean it has the highest number density of all the species? So, uh, can you repeat the final question? Yeah, there, and I, it was actually like a different slide. And at, at the top, it said something like, you know, muon flavor is dominant or, or something ah, like that. The, for the neutrino, probably. New mu most abundant, followed by new bar. Yeah, so could you explain why that is? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, um, so, what, what, we, what we analyze is that it's all coherent with, okay. I think uh, what we trace back is that everything is cool. So here we are assuming that the gas goes into equilibrium. So it's an equilibrium process. So everything boils down to the degeneracy parameter. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, they just, the, the reason is that both electrons in a very high density, both the electrons and the muons are degenerate, but uh, one is uh, relativistic and the other one is not relativistic. And this sets a slight difference in the chemical potential because of that term. And then it turns out that uh, Anti-muons are slightly favored in terms of they are a bit more degenerate, if you want, than, than anti-muon. This sets this, uh, this small difference. And, and then just a quick follow-up. Does this, does this translate into significant changes in the emission or, or no? It's hard to say because when you do a post-processing where you don't have an effect, uh, you can only see what would have been possibly the present. What we computed is that uh, the, the pressure at the end, uh, once from the simulation and after the simulation, and we saw that uh, there is a spread, which could be significant because uh, you see there is a, you can go down to minus 5%. So it's an effect uh, comparable to a phase transition or what is actually, why I don't expect a dramatic effect on the other hand, because most of this lack of pressure is due to the fact that we are doing wrong since the very beginning, because we are neglecting the cold muons. So my, my fear is that most of this contribution is simply because we are using a different equation state. We cannot answer unless we perform a simulation with muons. But there could be no linear effect in the neutrino sector that comes out. Who knows? It's complicated business. Um, not in the field, so very simple questions like uh, the muons that you produce are non-relativistic or no relativistic yes 
Uh, is it possible to produce also pions? Yes. Oh, yes. Do you no, take no, no. that into account? No, not yet. Huh? The, there is a work, actually, uh, it was quoted. I quoted it, uh, I, know, I think, in the very beginning. I quote that there is a work, uh, if you want to take notes. Uh, For pions and muons, there are these two works. Here in this case, it's a work from uh, GSI group. Uh, Martinez Pinedo is the PI, and Via uh, uh, Viayan, I think, is, was, a, was a PhD. They, they also include pions. The difference between the pions and the muons is that with the pions, you don't know how to make them appear. You know that they are there, but the way in which they appear and the way they interact is, is very much subject to the, the modeling. So they tested two or three equation of state with pions, and they were actually getting opposite results, from totally negligible to totally dominant, for example, with respect to muons. The good point with muons is that uh, we know how muons behave. They don't interact strongly. It's just a missing piece, uh, but it's a piece of cake. Should be. Kind. My question was uh, <clears throat> stimulated by the fact that if you have muons and he, you have muon neutrinos, there should be pions. In exactly, way. exactly. This is also their claim. You cannot uh, do them at the same time. Another question. Are neutrinos emitted isotropically? No. No. This actually, I think it was very nice. The plot that Davi showed that the mean energy is very different. And most of the luminosity is channeled in the funnel because you don't have the disk to shield while lower luminosity is here. In the literature, typically, there are values uh, that say that uh, the ratio between the luminosity along the pole and along the equator is at least of the order of one third. So this is three, at least three times larger than this one. Thank you. What does it imply? What does it imply for kicks of the stars if you have asymmetric emission? Kick? Huh? Yes, kick velocity. Uh, do you have a work about that? Uh, asymmetric ejection of uh, the, in the case of neutron sun merges, dominated by asymmetric ejection of the ejecta themselves. While uh, neutrinos are asymmetric as a function of angle, but they are close to axis symmetric, uh, so the contribution to the kick is not so large. Of course, I will ask about these <laughs> lovely iron 60 I calculations. Knew, I knew. Yes, I wait till the end. Um, so can you, so you have a very strong angular dependence yeah. on that ratio. Is that angular uh, dependence, will that be maintained over 100 parsecs? I don't know, like, honestly. Isn't, because if I think of uh, the ejecta being eventually mixed into the interstellar medium, yeah. my ratio as an sure. average is not. No, 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 you're right, you're right. There, there is a big hypothesis and it's the fact that the, the ejecta maintains. The, the scale where you definitely expect mixing to occur is the fade, fading radius of the remnants. We estimated uh, from, I think there are very few works about the kilonova remnant. We estimated uh, with the uh, work from people from Santa Cruz, uh, one of the few works that study the ejection. And uh, it should be what I call our fate there. This is definitely the rate where the, the kilonova remnant practically disappear in the stellar, interstellar medium. Doesn't mean that uh, uh, there is some mixing also before. It's, a, it's an assumption of our model, the fact that the system can retain. I think this depends very much also on the density of interstellar medium. I'm not an expert, but that's my guess. The, the good point, if you want, is that uh, if I look at this graph, uh, the, there is a range of 20, 30 angles over which the ratio stays roughly constant. I would have be more cautious if the ratio would have been small, 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 Good, small, 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 because then it means that you are fine tuning dramatically. This is just telling us that uh, over a range of 20, 30 degrees, uh, we can still allow some internal mixing. We cannot allow mixing with uh, the polar with the equatorial. 
large scale mixing. Yeah, it's still a large scale that graph. I I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Let's say. <laughs> Sorry, okay, you... okay, I'm not entirely convinced. It's a log scale, so it's uh, if you put it at, on a linear scale, I think maybe it would look much sharper. I don't know. Honestly, we, we look in the literature. I don't know if you have better references no, to we study don't. this There's, mixing. We looked as well about what to do with the remnant. It's, so what I'm saying is there. that yeah, yeah. provided the fact that the mixing is not efficient to scrap our theta dependent. Of course, okay. if you do that, no way. You you go back to your result, which I think if we integrate everything, I think uh, we just get it slightly better than you, but not dramatically. Exactly, it's really yeah. you need really to look from the pole if you want. Otherwise, okay. it doesn't work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I will also be interested to check out the other uh, ratios that you have. Yeah. Yeah. I put in a backup slide. I have them. Okay. I don't know. You want to do it offline or? Okay, okay. Uh, could, you, could you summarize for us uh, the main differences between the neutrino signal, which is emitted by a merger event like this, and uh, from a core collapse supernova? So I would say that in terms of spectra, provided the fact that uh, I'm pretty sure that the more reaction we will include, the more the spectrum will get closer, especially at late time. I think that the, the, the most prominent difference is the year of inversion in terms of luminosity. The fact that in core collapse, the peak that you have is in Nui because you have the two deleptonized measure and only after that, uh, the two becomes closer. Here, you have a peak in anti-Nui yes. and then the two become closer. The, the duration of the signal is... Uh... The duration is, uh, is a, I mean, it's very similar to the cooling of a proto-neutron star, I would say. I, I'm not aware, I think you have one of the longest simulation with uh, with a, a massive remnant emitting neutrinos, and it's uh... yeah, so it's the same. And the total amount of energy also is uh, emitted in the probably is a bit larger here because you have more mass, but it's slightly hotter. But I would say order of magnitude should be the same. Yeah, we this, uh, yeah, so about 0.1 mass in energy. Ah, right. 0.1. Right, just, but with different scale is very different. Right. Uh, so I would just repeat the um, the overall energy budget for neutrinos is about 0.1 solar mass times c squared, huh? which is curiously also the same amount of energy releasing gravitational waves. The two luminosities are very different simply because the time scales are very different. But as as far as we can say at the moment, yes. I don't know if there is, there will be more or the geometry. Okay, maybe last a few because, uh, I mean, we can go on. Then the question arises, are the oscillations the same in the core collapse supernova and in? We, we had, there are a couple of papers. So one is also with uh, Christine and myself. The other one is uh, with, uh, uh, with Gail. And Gail has, well, Christine has worked a lot on that. I think that the, the kind of geometry that you are, correct me if, I'm, if I don't summarize it correctly, the geometry, the fact that you have a disk rather than a sphere, and the fact that you have an excess of anti-neutrino can actually put in a very different situation co co compared with what you have in core collapse, where you have a spherically symmetric and you have a, a, a dominance of electron neutrino. So there, are, there is this uh, meta-neutrino resonances that arise from the fact that when you make uh, in the, in the coupling of the neutrino neutrino interaction, n nu e minus n nu e bar, you have an opposite sign compared with the case of standard neutrino standard oscillation in core collapse supernovae. And this is precisely due to the fact that uh, the geometry of the neutrino sphere is very far from a sphere. These are neutrino sphere. You can imagine the flux that comes out is completely different. And then if you fold into that the energy dependence, for the low energy, the neutrino sphere is a sphere. For the high energy neutrino sphere, it's like uh, an elephant here. So it's a, mm, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe even co collapse supernova, the spherical symmetry is not such a good uh, symmetry. I mean, there have exactly, been many more. Yeah, all the, right, yeah right. so that, but that's the year one first order. But uh, there are many similarities between the two environments, and that produces also similarities with some differences on flavor conversion. But uh, 
the two fields are really tightly related, mm. even from the point of view of flavor conversion. Yeah, and from the point of view of the theoretical description that I used to treat them. So very many analogies with the, between the two. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions or comments, let us thank Albino again. And thank you for all your comments and questions. So we uh, reconvene.